I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. It's supposed to be the happiest place on earth, but you could have fooled me. It was 1976, and I was on my first family trip to Walt Disney World. The day was going great, until I got scared on a ride. No, it wasn't the Haunted Mansion. I love that one. It was Pirates of the Caribbean. What did you say? If you've been to the Disney theme parks, you know that most of the rides are not like the ones you'd find at your traditional amusement parks. Most of the Disney rides take place entirely indoors. And... You get pulled through a series of rooms that are like movie sets that have live-action shows going on in them. But these live stage shows aren't being performed by actors. They are performed by robots. Most of the popular rides at Disney World use a lot of robots. When you ride a boat through It's a Small World, you are surrounded by 240 robots. But the rides are such perfectly orchestrated fantasies, they don't even register with you as robots, because you are being entertained by a highly technical illusion. Of course, something that technical is bound to malfunction, and that's what happened on my ride through the Pirates of the Caribbean. I had no problems with the creepy skeletons or the pirate ships that were shooting cannonballs, but then... We got to a town square where we were surrounded by lifelike pirates. At first, the pirates are funny with that yo ho, yo ho song playing non stop. But then we floated under a bridge where a drunken pirate sat at the top swinging his legs, and one of the legs of the drunken pirate dangled right above us. This figure wasn't far away from us like the rest of the robots were. This pirate was close to us, and I could see that this robot, this fake thing, had hairy legs, and the hair looked real. I don't know why, but that's what scared me. And just when we passed him, and we floated into a shadowy underground dungeon, the boat just stopped. Something somewhere failed, and the ride's safety systems made the boat stop. The system may have stopped the boats, but the rest of the ride kept on going. The music kept going and the pirates kept laughing, and the women kept screaming. It felt like we were there for a very long time, and I started getting anxious. In front of us was a jail cell with a group of desperate pirates locked inside of it. They whistled, and they begged a dog that held a ring of keys in its mouth to come closer to them. We all sat quietly in the boat, trapped in the dark dungeon with these things. The pirates continued to repeat their motions and their words and their whistles over and over again. And I noticed how real the pirates' eyes looked. But something was wrong with the eyelids. These pirates didn't blink. And while these robots kept repeating their motions, I got this terrible feeling that one of them was going to stop. One of them would stop repeating the motions and stare right back at me. And then he'd break right out of that jail cell and come after me. And I knew I couldn't run back the way I came because I was sure. I just knew that the drunken sailor had crawled down the bridge and he was waiting for me in the darkness of the tunnel. By the time we got off the ride, I needed to be calmed down. It wasn't the skeletons and it wasn't the cannonballs or the guy slowly being drowned in a well that scared me. It was the pirates who almost looked real. They seemed too alive to be robots, but too dead to be alive. To my childish eyes, they were unnatural, and they were monstrous. There's a hypothetical term used to describe my extreme reactions to these robots. It's called the Uncanny Valley. Now, the Uncanny Valley describes that creepy feeling or the revulsion that we feel when we see things that look or move or act like humans, but we know they aren't human. The most common targets for this harsh reaction are the automatons. This includes robots and ventriloquist dummies and mannequins and realistic dolls. Now, not all robots and dummies and dolls bother us. 
just the ones that start looking eerily human. The more an automaton resembles a human, the more uncanny or creepy you think it is. I'll give an example. Homer Simpson. Say, the first time you see Homer Simpson, he's drawn on a poster. He doesn't look photorealistic, and you immediately like Homer, and your pleasure spikes. Then you watch the cartoon, and you see an animated Homer moving and running around. He's so exaggerated in how he moves and looks, you'd never mistake him for being real. You like the cartoon even more than the drawing, so you get an even higher pleasure spike. But then, you see a 3D animation of Homer, and he runs around like he did in the cartoon. But now... He has mass and depth and shadow, and it looks a little creepy to you. You like that less than a 2D cartoon because he's starting to feel a little human, but in a freaky way, and your pleasure drops. And then you see a 3D model rendering of what Homer Simpson would look like if he was human, and he was flesh-colored, and he had facial stubble and his eyeballs were moist. And then imagine... They made that figure run around like a cartoon Homer. Congratulations, you have landed in the Uncanny Valley. There are a lot of theories as to why we respond the way we do when an imitation comes too close to the real thing. Some say it's an instinctual fear of death that's triggered by seeing these dead things moving around. Some say it's an unconscious threat to religious views around human identity and the soul. Others say it's an old warning bell left over from our Neanderthal days that made us stay away from the sick and the diseased. No matter what causes it, we all have a common anxiety around this. There's something somewhere out there for each of us that's waiting to take us into the uncanny valley. And with computer-generated images and artificial intelligence challenging what reality even means anymore, there's plenty to get anxious about. This fear of something that pretends to be human has been around a lot longer than computers and robots. Just the names of the monsters have been changed. The Doppelganger, the Wendigo, the Rakshasha, the Skinwalker. Nearly every culture in the world has some form of shapeshifter in its lore. So there seems to be a universal fear of monsters that want to impersonate us or someone we love. All the film versions of Invasion of the Body Snatchers are about creatures that infiltrate a community by camouflaging themselves as one of the group. These films exploit our fear of losing our identities and losing control of our own bodies. They hit on the horrible thought of being reduced to a walking shell without a soul, a hollowed out human, a meat robot. Philip Kaufman's remake is a great example of The Uncanny Valley. There's the infamous scene where Donald Sutherland falls asleep and the pod next to him activates and his imitation self slowly forms. When the imitation first slides out of the pod, it's slimy and featureless and creepy. But as it continues to form and it takes on some of Donald Sutherland's features, the imitation goes from creepy to disturbing to truly grotesque. But Kaufman also shows characters in the movie experiencing the uncanny valley themselves. Even though the pod people are exact replicas, their families instinctively know that these people are strangers, that they are no longer their loved ones. There's no credible evidence to prove this. Instead, they have an overwhelming, creepy feeling that something important is missing from their loved ones, something deeper than physical looks. But they can't articulate what it is, and so nobody believes them until it's too late. Invasion of the Body Snatchers gives us a monster that was always out there in the shadows somewhere, looking for prey. But then, there's the monster that we create ourselves. We conjure this monster to do our bidding, or to entertain us, or to even be our companions. But, as we strive to perfect our creation, the creation grows out of our control. Fear of losing control of the monster we make goes all the way back to the Sorcerer's Apprentice and the Golem and Frankenstein. All of them are cautionary tales about the hubris of daring to step into God's workshop. In both the Golem and the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the inanimate objects that get turned into automatons are dangerous. They have no intelligence. And all they can do is follow their creator's commands, literally. And if the creator forgets any small detail, 
everything falls into chaos and destruction. The golem and sorcerer's apprentice says that man will try to create life without the power to create a soul or free will, and that hubris will be his downfall. But Frankenstein is different. Victor Frankenstein makes his creature from the inanimate body parts of dead people, including a brain. And when it is born, the creature is sentient, and it can put together rudimentary thoughts. And in time, the creature begins to learn. And even more importantly, the creature begins to teach itself. In a way, the Frankenstein monster is the first version of artificial intelligence. Frankenstein considers his creation an abomination, and he banishes it from his sight. He miscalculates the intelligence of the creature, and he gets the people he loves killed. Now let's take a closer look at some of those things that make us feel creepy just by existing, our own abominations. Sometimes, a human form just standing still can scare you. Have you ever been out walking at night and you see a shadowy figure in a dark yard and you stop and stare to see if it moves? And then you realize it was a picnic table umbrella or a tall hedge. But you stopped purely because you saw a human form. And that human form was not moving. And you were full of dread because you feared that it might suddenly start moving right towards you. A body not in motion can be just as frightening as a moving one. Are you the kid who couldn't go into department stores when you were young because the mannequin scared you? You were surrounded by all these bodies on pedestals and their heads were tilted to stare at you. Did it look like they were going to all jump on you from the edge of the aisles? If you want to feel the uncanny valley of department store dummies, there are some great examples in movies. Tourist Trap may be the weirdest and creepiest slasher film ever made. If you do have a mannequin phobia, the movie's awesome poster itself might keep you away. The story follows a group of teenagers who go to a funky roadside wax museum, a tourist trap that is run by a crazy Chuck Connors. The museum is filled with lifelike mannequins who animate and start killing the teens. That may sound absurd, but this movie is so effective because of how surreal the encounters with the mannequins are. These mannequins have dark, empty eye sockets, and their jaws are hinged, and their mouths open grotesquely large. And there is this constant sound of sighing as they slowly surround their prey. And when the mannequins' mouths drop open, they let out blood-curdling screams. This movie distorts mannequins in a way that I think, could only be thought up by someone who has a phobia about department store dummies and waxworks. Here's a question for you. Is there a more disturbing model of the human form than the anatomical medical dummy? He's the skinless, life-sized man who students use to study his muscles and his organs. Every fear you have about the fragility of your body is exposed right there in plain sight. And the medical dummy passively stares out at you with those wide open eyes. What would you do if it started talking to you? That's the unsettling premise to the little scene horror film, Pin. The name Pin is the nickname the doctor gives his medical dummy so his children won't be afraid of it. Pin is short for Pinocchio. The doctor uses ventriloquism to have Pin entertain and even teach his children. But when dad isn't around, Pin keeps talking to the sun. The filmmakers knew that Pin didn't need to move a muscle to scare the audience. Just looking at that face would be enough. Since we're discussing medical dummies, I'll tell a personal story. When I first learned CPR, I was introduced to Rasasa Annie, sometimes called CPR Annie. Annie was a CPR dummy, which had a torso with a collapsible rib cage and a head with a flexible jaw and neck for training. If you've ever learned CPR, you've probably met Annie too, because she's the most widely used dummy on the market. And you also probably know that this dummy has a teenage girl's face that is realistic enough to be uncanny. So there's a story that goes along with that face. 
The story is that a Swedish doctor created Annie after his 16-year-old daughter drowned and the rescue team couldn't save her due to poor training. At that time, all CPR training was performed on cadavers, so the training was spotty. He created a doll, and he had the doll's face made to resemble his daughter as a tribute. Of course, it's just a story. The real story is that Annie's face is based on the death mask of an unidentified woman who drowned in Paris in 1881. Back then, coroners made death masks of the unidentified bodies, and they would display them to see if anyone recognized the face. The mold of that death mask was available when they were designing the face for the CPR dummy, and so it got used. But I'll bet you heard a similar story, like the doctor and his daughter, in your training. So why make up the story about the doctor and his daughter? Because it gave everyone who was in training a needed dose of empathy. Because when you first see that peaceful but dead face on Rasasa Annie, and you touch that spongy, cold skin. It is uncanny. But if the instructor tells a story that feels personal and tragic, the class empathizes, and everyone feels a human connection where there is none. And we all get over our case of the willies. Now, a little personality may help a group of trainees warm up to Rasasa Annie, but it's not going to help the next group of automatons become less creepy. In fact, it might be that their personalities make them even creepier. Are you one of the kids that was afraid of ventriloquist dummies? Are you one of the adults that is still afraid of ventriloquist dummies? You're not alone. These little handheld nightmares either make you laugh or they completely freak you out. Everything about ventriloquist dummies is creepy, especially to kids, because they're about the same size as a kid, but they've got these exaggerated, wide-eyed faces. They look deformed, and the friendlier the creators try to make them, the creepier they look. For example, the ones that have a constant smile never stop baring their teeth. But what makes them truly uncanny is that they have weird personalities and a weird voice. In the right ventriloquist's hands, they seem like they are really alive. At times, you can forget that there's only one person on that stage. And sometimes, it's hard to tell who's in charge, the ventriloquist or the dummy. Back in 1945, the movie Dead of Night suggested that the soul and the will of the ventriloquist was transferred into his dummy, and he was a slave to the doll. And I think that hits on the instinctual fear we have of these things. They imitate us because they want to become us. Skinwalkers want to take your skin, but the automatons want to take your soul. If you really want to feel the uncanny valley for a ventriloquist dummy, watch 1978's Magic with Anthony Hopkins and Fats, the creepiest dummy ever. I mean, just the commercial to that movie traumatized an entire generation of kids. But let's go back to that freaky boat ride I took on the Pirates of the Caribbean. My rational mind knew that these were robots, they're puppets on moving sticks. They were golems, they had no intelligence, and only followed the commands that were given them. But my irrational mind kept thinking that one of them could be a Frankenstein monster. I mean, the same guy that made this ride also made Pinocchio. What if some kind of magic brought one of them to life? I don't know if writer-director Michael Crichton ever got stuck on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride when it malfunctioned, but I do know the ride inspired him to make his 1973 movie, Westworld. Now, when we talk about technology run amok or killer robots, there are a few movies that always get mentioned, and rightfully so. Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey has HAL 9000, and The Terminator has the T-800 Model 101, and Blade Runner has The Replicants. But Westworld has Yul Brenner as the gunslinger. I know you might think I'm being intentionally perverse, but I put Westworld and the gunslinger on the same pedestal as those other cinema giants. In fact, I think Westworld has an even more biting commentary than the others on how we give our souls willingly to the mannequin dummy. Because in 2001, HAL 9000 may be considered one of the crew, But the crew is aware that he was created to keep them alive in deep space. And Skynet, the computer that creates the T-800 Exterminatus, was built on our paranoia as a powerful defense system. 
and the replicants of Blade Runner were created to do dangerous jobs and save human lives. So in all those movies, we gave away our control to the robots for protection and safety. In Westworld, we give it all away for entertainment. In Westworld, Armageddon is brought to us on the heels of convenience. With the Terminator, you can see how the good intentions of protection mutated into giving one too many controls to one too many programs. But in Westworld, the problem comes from trying to create the most seductive and indulgent vacation money can buy. The movie centers around Delos, the adult amusement park of the future. For $1,000 a day, guests can forget about the real world and immerse themselves in one of three theme parks, Roman World, Medieval World, or Westworld. Each of these worlds is populated with robots who are programmed to interact with the guests and allow them to do anything they want to indulge their fantasies. Would it surprise you that these fantasies revolve around killing and sex? The allure of Westworld is that the robots are so sophisticated that you can't tell they aren't human, except for the palms of their hands and when light reflects off their pupils. You shoot the robots with real guns, and they bleed, and they die, and they are repaired at night. The robots are programmed to let you win, and every precaution is covered. So what could possibly go wrong, right? Just like in real life. There are too many application upgrades, and it weakens the operating system. In the rush to make the guest's experience one click and plug and play, a half-baked upgrade is incompatible with existing code, and a virus is created. And before you know it, the guests are being slaughtered by robots that are faster and stronger than they are. And that brings us to The Gunslinger, a movie monster that is probably more influential than you realize. What I love about Westworld is that the movie has this jarring shift in tone, and you can see it in how you respond to the gunslinger. Yul Brenner is dressed as his character was from The Magnificent Seven, and it's a sly joke. He's comic relief in the first half of the film because he's programmed to lose gunfights. Would you pay $1,000 to beat the fastest gun in The Magnificent Seven in a draw? Oh, hell yes. But when the gunslinger's program is corrupted... He becomes the perfect killing machine. When a guest who is being chased by the gunslinger finds a technician, he asks him what he can do to stop the robot. After the technician talks about how that model is a beautiful machine with the best sensory devices, he tells the guest, there's nothing you can do. If he's after you, he'll get you. You haven't got a chance. The conversation is eerily similar to when Reese describes the Terminator to Sarah Connor for the very first time. And Yul Brenner's stone face and his forceful walk may just remind you of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Did you know that John Carpenter cites the gunslinger as one of the influences for the shape from Halloween? And you can see how it could influence him in the final act, where the gunslinger never speaks and he seems impossible to kill. But the single most disturbing scene in Westworld comes towards the end. The main character is walking through the dungeons of medieval world, when he hears a woman weakly begging for help. He comes across a woman who's chained to a wall, and she is weak, and she is battered. He tells her she's going to be okay, and he can help her. He gets a ladle of water and gets her to drink from it, and sparks fly from her mouth, and the robot breaks down. I kept thinking that her entire program was written to have her sit alone in a dungeon, chained to a wall, crying out for help. She would execute those commands for hours and for days until someone came by to activate that next line of code. What a horrible loneliness created just for someone's idea of a fantasy. This makes me think of the next generation of robot, the upgraded technical advancement of the replicants from Blade Runner, specifically I think of Pristratton, the basic pleasure model, which is a term they use in Westworld too. The replicants are synthetic humans, but they are also walking artificial intelligence programs. They have a basic program, a series of uploaded memories and personality traits that they then learn from. But Pris will never be as sophisticated as Roy Batty, even if they have the same experiences. 
Why? Because her pleasure program isn't designed for her to advance in that way. She will always come off as a little lost and a little vulnerable and in need of comforting. And that makes her so scary. The moment that takes me into the uncanny valley is when Pris meets J.F. Sebastian, the genetic engineer who helped create her. She's hiding in an alley under a pile of newspapers when Sebastian stumbles upon her and he startles her. Pris runs off like an animal, and when she reaches the end of the valley, she slams into Sebastian's car and her elbow smashes the glass window. She's not in pain. She doesn't even look at her arm to see if she's cut. The damage doesn't even register to her. And that's when we realize that this thing is impersonating a fragile waif, that underneath it all, she can tear us limb from limb as easily as Roy Batty could. And we know she has used this camouflage before to manipulate humans into having empathy for her, to make them forget she's not human. It's what her AI program is designed for, after all. We experience the uncanny valley when we see something that isn't human coming uncomfortably close to how humans look and move and act. But with the growth of AI, we now have anxiety over how computers and robots think. What happens if the computer starts to outthink the computer scientist? A movie that dives into that anxiety is Alex Garland's Ex Machina. Caleb Smith is a programmer for a Google-like search engine company, and he wins an in-house coding contest. As a reward, Nathan Bateman, the CEO, invites Caleb to his private island to brainstorm a new project. When he gets there, Caleb finds out that Nathan has developed a humanoid robot and that he's been asked to the island to administer the Turing test. This is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior that is equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human being. However, Nathan wants to test more than whether the robot can hold a human conversation. He wants to see if Caleb can relate to the robot, even though he knows she's a robot. The robot is named Ava, and she is, without a doubt, a mechanical device. Her entire body is robotic wire mesh, except for a very human-looking face. The face is reminiscent of a death mask, except that it is fully articulate and holds very soulful eyes. Ava's physical body won't persuade Caleb to relate to her as a human, so she must convince him that she's capable of thought and consciousness. She's a computer that must make a computer programmer feel empathy for her program. She needs to fool Caleb. She needs to be smarter and more empathetic than him to pass. As the movie goes on, we realize that the stakes are higher than a mere pass-fail. There may be more than one test going on here. But AI isn't just about IQ intelligence or robots passing themselves off as human. Sometimes AI can be used to create a machine that simulates instinct and the thought process of self-preservation. In 2015, roboticists at Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris unveiled a robot that could heal itself in two minutes. If the robot is damaged in action, the robot taps into experiences from simulated lives within its AI and makes repairs based on that data. The AI program allows robots to adapt to extreme changes in environment and keep itself going until its objective is met. Just think of all the good uses that could have. And then think of what the worst use for a self-healing robot might be. All the way back in 1990, director Richard Stanley thought of the worst possibility already. His movie Hardware is set in a world where nuclear war has created deserts where the seas used to be, and everyone just adapts to this new normal. A scavenger finds a robotic head in the sand and sells it to a marine who gives it to his artist girlfriend to use in one of her projects. She works in metal sculpture inside of her apartment, and when she sees the head, she makes it the centerpiece in her new creation. However, unbeknownst to any of them, this robot head is part of a combat robot called the Mark 13, which has reactivated itself. It is a self-repairing war machine, and it begins to use the scrap metal and the very infrastructure of the apartment building to build itself into a weapon to complete its mission. And 
its mission is genocide. I know, all this might sound a little reactionary and anti-technology. I assure you I'm not anti-technology. There are great things that can be done with robots and AI that can be beneficial to mankind. It can be a positive force, even for military defense. But the purpose of horror is to express that anxious thought and to allow the cautionary tale to be told. Horror tends to take the pulse of the current society and finds what we're nervous about. For the most part, our anxiety is caused by things that give us that creepy feeling of the uncanny valley, but they're really harmless. Things like Showa Hanako, the hyper-realistic dental training android robot that wiggles its tongue and screams in pain at a bad drilling. Or Saya, the reception robot who has 27 artificial face muscles to scare children and adults alike out of your office. But some news items give me pause. In 2016, MIT created the Nightmare Machine, which is a series of algorithms to generate ghoulish faces to try to find the root of horror in humans. They posted the computer generations to get the user feedback to see which approach makes the freakiest images. In other words, MIT is using AI to teach computers what we are most afraid of and then train them how to scare us the most effectively. In 2012, Pedro Bravo murdered his roommate and then asked Siri where he could bury the body. Siri asked him what kind of place he was looking for and then gave the killer several locations. Siri recommended nearby mines, dumps, reservoirs, and rivers. There are black box algorithms that determine your credit score, FICO. What computations go into it exactly and precisely, nobody really knows. A group of hackers called the Flash Boys exploited Wall Street's black box algorithms to alter the markets with high frequency trading. Most people didn't know that Wall Street trades are mostly done by algorithms instead of human beings these days, but the Flash Boys did. And back in 2013, the Associated Press Twitter account was hacked and posted a fake news report about two explosions in the White House and that President Obama was injured. Even though it never happened, and AP noticed immediately the thousands of algorithms monitoring the web for news instantaneously reported the fake item across the world. The markets had a massive sell-off on the news of terrorism, and in three minutes, the markets lost $136 billion. There was no time for human intervention, and there were no sources to corroborate. It was one tweet and three minutes. Maybe that's where our real collective anxiety is coming from. Maybe we're realizing that our lives have become like the boat ride through the Pirates of the Caribbean. We float through a highly technical illusion where everything around us is connected by an electrical circuit and an invisible radio wave. Maybe the biggest illusion is that we think we are floating through this ride. The reality is that we are being dragged from one room to another on a rail that is just below the surface of the water. Is the ventriloquist still in charge? We are surrounded by machines engaged in a long, silent conversation of zeros and ones, and we're the only ones not speaking the language, which is unfortunate for us because we are the focus of their conversation. Of course, Something this technical is bound to malfunction. And when that happens, there is an emergency shutoff that will kick in automatically. But my question is, which of these robots controls that? And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. You can find Hellbent for Horror on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And H4H has its own app. You can download it from the Google or Amazon store for Android, and the iPhone version is available on the iTunes store. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay hell-bent.